Please rise for the call to worship. We worship God who is our dwelling place in all generations. We worship the God who brought forth the mountains and formed the earth. We praise God who satisfies us with steadfast love. We rejoice in God who greets us each day with compassion. We thank God whose power is revealed to God's people. We celebrate God's favor upon us. Let us worship our God. Hymn of praise number seven. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers but their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night they are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither and all that they do they prosper is there anything more majestic than a tree with its broad trunk and beautiful leaves especially this time of year when it shows off its colors of red, orange, and gold. But did you know that science is discovering that the true majesty is what's happening underground? Come to find out these trees, they support each other with their root system and not just their own species. They form an arboreal community that depends upon each other to grow, survive, and thrive. If the trees sense that one of them is not flourishing, the healthy among them will push extra nutrients towards it through the root system. And when one of them knows 
that it's at the end of its life cycle, it's, it will push all of its nourishment out to the next generation that will take its place. That is what we're called to be, a community that serves, feeds, and supports each other so that we can all flourish, we can all yield fruit and, pos and prosper. And our strength flows from what is represented at this table, the love of Jesus. For without it, and without each other, we wither away. Let us pray. God, we hold nothing back. We thank you for the assurance of your love for us that we have at this table. Thank you for these symbols, the bread and the cup, that brings this all to mind again. As we remember Jesus, let us also commit to love you and love those around us with as much of your love as we can help flow through us. Fill us with that love that we may share it with the world crying out for it. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ broken for us. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me the blood of Christ given for you and me for as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes this is not my table. This is not the church's table. This is God's table. All are, invade, are invited to come forth and partake of the bread and partake of the cup. Let us feast. Our scripture for today is Matthew 22, 34 through 46. Matthew 22, 34 through 46. So please join me. The greatest commandment. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest of first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at the right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The word of God for the people of God and the church says, Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, my Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So we've been talking about, for the past few weeks, about how the established religious leaders, and please, that's what's important here. It's not that they were Jewish Pharisees, because Jesus was a Jewish Pharisee. It, no, the, what's important is that they, they were the established protector of the tradition leaders. And they were scared of this Jesus who is just turning everything upside down, including tables, and getting everyone all riled up. We have established religious protectors of the tradition leaders today that are scared of Jesus because he still turns everything upside down and gets people all riled up. Especially those that are sitting in their pews Sunday after Sunday, just wait. So anyway, these leaders keep coming back to Jesus trying to trip him up, hoping that he would lose faith 
face in front of the people who are enamored with him at the moment, or, or that he might say something that the Roman Empire would consider sedition, which wasn't hard to do. But Jesus keeps coming back at them with thoughtful, you've got to be kidding me, this changes everything, answers, and, and he still does that today. So he decides to turn it around and ask them a question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? God's people have been expecting a promised Messiah for centuries because the ancient prophets continually wrote of a day when everything shall be made clear and all would be made right and everyone will know who God is. And there will be one person who will usher in this age. They believe that this Messiah, or Mashiach, would be in the lineage of David because of scripture such as Isaiah 11, 1, where it reads, A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So, of course, they said, He will be the son of David. David, who God promised in 2 Samuel 7, 16, Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. David, who is often referred to as a man after God's own heart. And what a man he was. In 1 Samuel 16, 18, he is described as one who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a warrior, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. So it is these characteristics that they are looking for in the sun that is going to usher in the new age. Now let's think about this. Can you imagine living under the rule of David? I mean, everything he did, he went whole hog. And I have a feeling that the energy that he gave off was really hard to resist. When he danced, I mean, he danced before the Lord with all of his might, not giving a care of what people thought as they watched him. When he sang and played his heart, evil spirits would leave. And when he prayed, he reached out to God with every part of his being. This was the kind of king that could bring people together, form armies, conquer enemies, and make God the center of everything. That is what they were looking for in a Messiah. That is why everyone was so excited when Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey. What a clever move. This is something like David would do. And then he's flipping over some tables. Yeah, finally, we've been waiting for this moment. Let's go. So again, Jesus says to him, says to them, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? What are you looking for? They replied, the son of David. Jesus then responds with, how is it that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, and this is the 110th Psalm, the Lord said to my Lord, that's what it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? In other words, wouldn't you think that King David would write, The Lord said to my son, my grandson, my great-grandson, whoever is next in line, sit at my right hand. Instead, King David wrote, The Lord said to my Lord, someone who blows all conventions and expectations of charisma and warrior away and replaces it with pure, divine, sacred, holy, sacrificial love. No rules, no laws, no fear, no shame, no oppression, no retribution, no conquering, just pure love. Which takes us back to the beginning of the scripture reading, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Is it one of the 10 commandments Moses brought down from Mount Sinai? Or is it one that speaks to cleanliness versus uncleanliness? How about the laws concerning circumcision or what we should eat? Which one is the greatest? Pick one. So we can tell you how you are wrong no matter what you say. Okay, 
Jesus is like, okay, how about this? Love is the greatest commandment, as in you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. And Jesus is not making this up out of clear air. This is written in Scripture. De Deuteronomy 6, 5. Except it even says, not just your heart and soul, but with all your strength. Love God with everything you've got. Why? Because God loves you. All of you. And not only that, but God loves everyone and everything that God created. So because of that, we should love our neighbor as ourselves. As written in Leviticus 19.18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. It's this love thing that messes everything up. Luke 22, we read of Jesus saying, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. The disciples say, look, Lord, we got two already. And then Jesus says, that's enough. Wait, what? Oh, oh, I know what you're going to do. You're going to multiply these swords like you did with the loaves and the fish. Oh, okay, you're not going to do that. Okay, how about this? When the fighting starts, swords will automatically appear. Wait, wait, Lord, wh why are you picking up the ear that I just lopped off the enemy and healing him? It's like you love him or something. Jesus, they're going to kill you. Fight. You're dead. I guess you're not the Messiah we're looking for. Of course, we know the rest of the story. You can't keep our Savior down. For in three days, our Messiah will be victorious over the grave and will be resurrected from death to live forever and ever. Alleluia. But do we truly know the rest of the story? Or even more important, do we truly believe the rest of the story? Because if we did, we would be far less concerned about convincing people and proving to people that Jesus is the Messiah. Even to the point that we want to fight people and conquer people that don't believe exactly what we believe. Instead, we would be loving people as God loves them. Because that is what Jesus, who we declare is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, did every day of his earthly ministry. To the point that he laid down his life for no greater love as this. And that is what Jesus calls us to do today. Love. But we want to win. Love wins. But there has to be a loser. Evil or Satan loses. But there's so much evil in the world. The fight's not over. And the battle belongs to the Lord. But let's get this straight. Our weaponry is not swords or guns or hate. And our ammunition is not bullets or judgment of others or bigotry or just plain rudeness. Our weaponry is love of God. And our ammunition is love of neighbor. Well, that's no fun. That's not exciting. That's not dramatic. If that's what you're looking for in the Messiah, then you've been watching way too many Marvel movies and reading too many fantasy novels. God doesn't promise us excitement, drama, or fun. God promises hope, joy, and peace. Not the Pax Romana peace of a Roman Empire that was established through threat of violence, but the Pax Deus, or the, Pax of, or the peace of God, that from the beginning was established through love. Like I said in the beginning, we are not to approach the scripture as a Jewish versus Christian issue. We're to approach it as a, what do we think or what do we want versus what Jesus thinks or Jesus wants. What do we think of our Messiah? Whose son is he? Is he the son of God or the son of empire? And then... What do we think our Messiah wants us to do? Does our Messiah want us to conquer? Or does our Messiah want us to love? I've had my moments of pride when I think back to my schooling to becoming an interpreter of the operatic classics, where we would just sit around and talk for hours about what did 
did Mozart mean by writing this melody and how exactly would it have been performed in the day? I would think haughtily, I still do. Now, how does that truly help the world? Does that feed a hungry child or correct a social injustice? But it's the same thing in the church. No matter how much we talk about or argue about love and what scripture and theology has to say about it and who is right and who is wrong, it isn't until we put love into action that God's true will and God's true kingdom will be made known on earth as it is in heaven. The first will be made last. The last will be made first. That is victory in the eyes of God. And it isn't accomplished by talk or wishing really hard. It's done by trusting in God and loving God and loving our neighbor as Jesus loves us. So yes, let us dance like David. Let us sing like David. Let us pray like David. But let us love and be victorious like Jesus, the Messiah of creation, the Son of God.